chaos. It's a word that seems to capture the zeitgeist of our age. Instability, wars, pandemics, and institutional breakdown. These have all led people to wonder, is anyone in control? Is there meaning and purpose to any of this? With endless choices and uncertain times, people today are less secure and more jaded than ever before. Doubts about everything are the new normal. We are living through an era that feels a bit mad. So how do we live by faith in a world of madness? This is what the book of Ecclesiastes is all about. It assumes doubts and offers answers not addressed anywhere else. It explores issues that haunt us at the end of life. In short, this ancient book offers meaning in the madness by directing us to the purpose giver, God himself. The world's answers are incoherent and incomplete. Through Ecclesiastes, the Holy Spirit shows us that order is possible in turmoil, meaning is birthed despite the chaos, and true beauty is revealed at the feet of our Creator King. Here we can truly discover meaning in the madness. Well, please turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 9, and as you do that, Allow me to share with you a surprising article that came out recently in New Yorker magazine, uh, which seemed to indicate that we're seeing a dramatic spike in the popularity these days in astrology. According to this uh, Pew Research Center poll, almost 30% of Americans now believe in astrology, 30%. Uh, but as author Nicholas Campion has written, the number of people who know their sun sign, consult their horoscope, or read about the sign of their romantic partner is actually much higher than that. Uh, the New York Times, in a piece entitled How Astrology Took Over the Internet, also heralded astrology's return. One report found that Americans spend $2.2 billion, with a B, billion dollars annually on mystical services, including uh, palm readers or tarot card readers. The astrology app CoStar is backed by $6 million and has been downloaded 6 million times, uh, especially uh, popular amongst the group of millennials uh, is something that the article highlighted. Uh, apparently, this generation sees no contradiction between using astrology and believing in science, which is fueling a resurgence in the practice. Uh, one of the more popular trends I read about is called manifesting. Uh, with the use of crystals. And so what manifesting is, is it involves focusing the mind on what you want in order to bring that about. And so you can manifest a new job, you can manifest a new boyfriend, you can manifest whatever your heart uh, desires there. The sky is the limit. Uh, the, the, the reason why astrology is becoming popular seems a little bit mysterious to me in light of our culture's secular trend. But it also coincides with the decline of organized religion and the rise of economic and political instability. In fact, going back about 100 years, the first newspaper astrology column was commissioned in August of 1930, right after the stock market crash. And after the financial collapse in 08, astrologists received calls from even Wall Street bankers. Uh, astrologer Rebecca Gordon said, this is the reason, quote, all of those structures that people had relied upon, 401ks and everything, started to fall apart. That's how people got into it. They're like, what's going on in my life, question mark? Nothing makes sense, end quote. Though very different, what all of those trends have in common is they are ways to deal with the problem of uncertainty. They are strategies to control what seems like it's out of control. And what's interesting to me about this research is it doesn't show uh, that this trend, which is growing amongst the nuns in our nation, is a group of people who are completely secular. Instead, they would prefer to describe themselves as spiritual, but not religious, as a religious hybrid, and they are getting involved in kind of a remix of religious ideas, wanting freedom to mix and match what might work for them. And though they might not submit to organized religion, they still have to deal with the uncertainties of life, and so do we. And so let me ask you, you may not be interested in astrology, but how, you, how do you deal with the uncertainties of your life? Do you face it head on, or do you move towards 
denial? Do you throw caution to the wind and live recklessly? Or do you try to manage all of your risks with every kind of insurance that's available out there? Nothing wrong with insurance, but studies show that now today we are more insured than we have ever been as a people. Simultaneously, we are also more anxious and nervous than we've ever been as a people. So though I'm not speaking out against insurance, I don't know that that really gets at the root problem of our uncertainty. And so how do you deal with your uncertainty? That's what Ecclesiastes chapter 9 is actually about. The point of our passage is Solomon is smashing the idol of certainty and predictability and control so that we might long for something deeper. And he is going to smash the idol of uncertainty with a few different hammers and show us the bankruptcy of certainty. He's going to say, think about it. Why do you even expect to have certainty? Where do you get that kind of idea in this world of madness? Where do you get ground for even demanding such certainty? The fact that there's something inside of human nature that desires something certain, something bedrock, something that we can build our, build our lives upon shows an inconsistency in a purely secular worldview. David Gibson writes in his commentary on Ecclesiastes, he, meaning Solomon, wrote his book to smash into tiny pieces our idea that we can be like God. We aspire to have it all, to know it all, to achieve it all, to be happy forever, to have all the answers, to never be left scratching our heads, and to be remembered for all time. And Solomon is telling us again and again and again, that's not possible. Though we try to be like God, we aren't like God. This is what Ecclesiastes chapter 9 is about. How do we deal with the uncertainties of life? How can we find meaning in that kind of madness? You'll notice there's three different sections to the text today, and they break down like this. First, Solomon will talk about the one thing in life that's certain. Second, Solomon will talk about the many things in life that are not certain. And then third, he's going to talk about all the things in life that don't require certainty for you to enjoy them. The one thing, the many things all the things. That's where we're headed. Let's pray. God, thank you for preserving this text so that we might see your wisdom. Uh, Thank you, Lord, that you have not left us without an anchor, without a hope, without something that's sure. And so we pray as we look at your word that you'd open up our eyes, ears, most of all hearts, for we need to hear not from a preacher, but from you today. And so speak, Lord. Your people are listening. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, movement one, the one thing in life that is certain. Chapter nine, verse one begins like this. Solomon says, so I reflected on all this and concluded that the righteous and the wise and what they do are in God's hands. But no one knows whether love or hate awaits them. All share a common destiny, the righteous and the wicked, the good and the bad, the clean and the unclean, those who offer sacrifices and those who do not. Pause right there. Let's have a pop quiz, a pop quiz. We've been in this series for a couple of months now. What do you think is the destiny or the event that Solomon is referring to in these first couple of verses? What is the destiny he's talking about? Anybody know? Death. Very good. You get an A on your test. We can all go home. Have a nice afternoon. He's going to mention death nine different times in this particular section. This is the one thing in life that's certain. And this goes for everyone, he says. Notice the righteous and the wicked, the good people, the bad people, the ugly people, the nice and the nasty, the believer, the unbeliever, the honest truth teller, and the lying deceiver, they all go into the ground at the end. Everyone dies. Solomon continues, says this, as it is with the good, so with the sinful. As it is with those who take oaths, so with those who are afraid to take them. This is the evil in everything that happens under the sun. The same destiny overtakes all. Pause there for a second. Friends, we have one universal problem that we all have to face in life. Death. Everybody dies. Statistics say, I'm going to die someday. And so are you. However, I found that many people don't like to talk about death. This week I read about a very strange yet interesting phenomenon that happens between Japanese doctors and their patients in Tokyo. See, most of the time when a Japanese doctor is treating a patient with cancer, he doesn't actually tell the patient what they're being treated for. And the patient doesn't actually ask what they're being treated for. So there's this Western reporter asking a Japanese doctor about this, and the doctor explained himself by saying this, quote, well, 
You have to understand that here in Japan, we don't really believe in an afterlife. Therefore, death is a hard thing for us to accept. So we just don't talk about it. Period. Now, although living in that kind of denial might sound very strange to us, I would submit to you that we here in the West are very much, as a society, pretty delusional about death ourselves. Just invite your friends over sometime, serve them some coffee and cake, and say, now that we're all here, let's talk about death. <laughs> See what happens. My hunch is they're going to pre pretty much excuse themselves from the table right away. Look, this guy's crazy. But Solomon is saying it's foolish to go through life unprepared for the one thing that's expected, inevitable, and certain. Solomon says, if we know this is going to happen, can we at least talk about it? He continues, the hearts of people, moreover, are full of evil, and there is madness in their hearts while they live, and afterward they join the dead. Anyone who is among the living has hope. Even a live dog is better off than a dead lion. That's a really strange verse. Back then, they didn't have cute little pet dogs like we have. D dogs were not a very valuable animal in this particular culture, but lions were mighty and e extremely strong and, and worthy. It reminds me of this old Peanuts cartoon called The Theology and the Dog. Charlie Brown quotes this verse from Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Take a look. As it says here in the ninth chapter of Ecclesiastes, a living dog is better than a dead lion. And Charlie says, what does that mean? And Snoopy says, I don't know, but I agree with it. <laughs> Wisdom, theology of the dog. Solomon's point is very simple. It's better to be alive than to be dead. Why? Because the day of opportunity in your life is here today in a way that it won't be here when you're dead. Author David Gibson writes about this dominant theme in the book of Ecclesiastes in this way, quote, the preacher will argue that wisdom, pleasure, work, and possessions are very often the bubbles we live in to insulate ourselves from reality. And his needle, Solomon's needle, the sharp point he uses to burst all of our bubbles is death. It is the great reality facing all human beings as they go about their business on earth. Death, he says, is, is the ultimate certainty that we erase from our minds and busy ourselves to avoid facing. Solomon continues the same theme with verse 5. He says, For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward, and even their name is forgotten. Their love, their hate, and their jealousy have long since vanished. Never again will they have a part in anything that happens under the sun. Pause there for a second. So, why is everything meaningless? Solomon says the answer, the reason, is death. The reason is because no one will be remembered, verse 5. Like the pharaohs who built the pyramids to house their dead bodies, we all long to be remembered when we're gone but Solomon says, it is very likely that we won't be. Friends, the reason we'd rather not think about death is because deep down, we're afraid. We're terrified. And the reason death is so scary is because in the moment of death, we must come to grips with the fact that we are no longer in control. There's no choices there. There's no options there. We can't negotiate with death. We can't flatter death. We can't appeal to it. We can't ignore it. And we can't change the channel. We have to deal with it somehow, some way, but we don't want to. So we live in denial, and our denial is how we're trying to cope with our fears. One of the people who was most influential in the field of psychology in the last century was Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. If you've ever heard of the grief cycle, she's largely responsible for the widespread use of the grief cycle. Very helpful. As much as I appreciate her work in the area of grief, I very much disagree with her attempt to deal with death and minimize the fear that people have about death. Because in her work, she tries to argue that there's nothing strange about death. She says, quote, the moment of death is neither frightening nor painful. It is just merely peaceful cessation. In other words, Kubler-Ross says that death is natural. You know what I say to that? Nonsense total nonsense. Instead, I submit to you a much more accurate sentiment as expressed by Dr. Tim Keller, who said this, every human heart instinctively knows that death is monstrous, that it is unnatural, that it is perverted, 
It's radically traumatic that it is alien and it is the ultimate enemy. This is what the scripture teaches. That death is a terrible thing. That death is an unnatural thing. That death is not the way it is supposed to be. So why does Solomon focus on death so much? Why is he talking about death? The reason is that Solomon believes that thinking about dying will prepare you to live. Thinking about dying will prepare you to live today. In other words, there's wisdom in knowing where you're headed and then starting from the end and then working your way backwards from there. There's this quote from the movie Braveheart where William Wallace says this, every man dies, not every man really lives. There's this scene in the movie where Wallace, Braveheart, is leading the Scottish army to fight for their freedom, but they're largely outnumbered and they're terrified of dying. And Braveheart is trying to challenge this army, and he says, will you fight? And then there's one particular soldier who speaks up and says, no, we will run, and we will live. And that's when Wallace says, I run, and you will live, at least for a little while. And then he says this, and then dying in your beds many years from now, Would you be willing to trade all the days from this day to that for one chance, just one chance, to come back here to this day and tell your enemies that they may take your lives, but they will never take your freedom? This is what Wallace and Solomon are both agreed on. Fast forward in your life many days from now to the time when you will be dying in your beds. And then, live today as you would have wished you would live on that day. In light of that, what would you have done? Again, David Gibson is helpful on this. In his book on Ecclesiastes, appropriately titled, Live Life Backward, don't miss the title, he says this, Left to our own devices, we tend to live life forward. We plan and hope and dream of where we will be. Ecclesiastes teaches us to live life backward. To take the one thing in the future that is certain, our death, and work backward from there, from that point, into all the details and all the decisions and all the heartaches of our lives and think about them from the perspective of the end. So that's the challenge in movement number one. In light of the one thing in life that's certain, death, Solomon says, live life backwards from there. Movement two. We've talked about the one thing that's certain. Now he'll talk about the many things that are uncertain. And I'm going to skip down to the end of the chapter because this is a bracketing technique or a sandwich technique where he has like two buns and a beef patty in the middle. So I'm just going to skip down to the bun and we'll come to the beef patty at the end because it's more appropriate homiletically for a sermon. So movement two, the many things in life that are uncertain. Drop down with me to verse 11 for a moment. He says this, I have seen something else under the sun. The race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong, nor does food come to the wise or wealth to the brilliant or favor to the learned, but time and chance happen to them all. Time and chance happen to us all. Sometimes, he says, life is quite unpredictable. The fastest person doesn't always come in as the winner. The strongest person doesn't always get the victory in the battle. The wise person doesn't always have an abundance of food. And the brilliant person doesn't always become wealthy. This is life. As Tommy Nelson says, Johnny Pagan might be the one scoring the touchdown, while you, the Christ follower, are fumbling the ball on the one. Life can be unfair, even if you work hard, even if you make good choices, even if you fear the Lord and you live your life to please God. Solomon says you always have to do all of that with an asterisk. Why? Because your natural abilities are not going to give you automatic success. Your life can be rudely interrupted like that. By what? Time and chance. It happens to us all. Solomon continues, verse 14. Moreover, no one knows when their hour will come. As fish are caught in a cruel net, or birds are taken in a snare, so people are trapped by evil times that fall unexpectedly upon them. Notice that word, unexpectedly. Again, more uncertainty. Evil times will come. You'll be like a fish that's caught in a net, going, how did I get here? And no one noticed that phrase at the beginning. No one knows. I mean, who really knows what's going to happen tomorrow? A war could start. The economy could tank. Your friends could leave you. Jesus could come back. I don't know, and neither do you. 
Just think about everything that's happened in the past 10 years of your life, looking back. Did you have any clue what your life would look like today? Chances are probably not. Probably there's been some surprises that have come along the way. I'm sure I'm not the only one. So it's hard to make plans with all of these uncertainties. Now, I am a planner. I'm not trying to speak against planning. I love planning. Where, where are my planners out there? Who's, who's a planner like me? Yeah, you know me. I had the yellow legal pad thing. I'm, I'm, like, I'm like obsessed with planning. Some of us are really good at planning. We make arrangements. We strategize. We set goals. We plan all the time. We have a weekly plan for work. We have like a family meal plan. Uh, we do planning. Pastor Bob and I have like a preaching plan. Some of you are financial planners. Some of you are event planners. Some of you are teachers. You make a lesson plan. I, I hope we all have some kind of retirement plan. That's all well and good. Nothing wrong with planning, but none of us knows what's going to happen tomorrow or even tonight, much less next year. We just don't know about the future. And because there's some things in life that are uncertain, they're impossible to plan for everything. We, we don't we don't plan for cancer. We don't plan for a miscarriage. We don't plan for sickness. Mike Tyson, that great theological thinker, said it like this. Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Some of you know what that's like. You've been punched in the mouth by life. We don't plan for a divorce. We don't plan to lose our job. We don't plan for tragedies. The unexpected things happen to us. There's a lot of unknowns. None of us knows what's going to happen in our personal lives or our career lives. Now, I realize there are some risks that we can and should try to manage. Some of you who work in insurance, this is like your whole job, and it is a noble profession. But if you think about it, is it really possible to know enough about the future that we can eliminate all possible risks? No. This is what Solomon is saying. There's too many uncertainties. Solomon continues, verse 13. He says, I also saw under the sun this example of wisdom that greatly impressed me. There was once a small city with only a few people in it, and a powerful king came against it, surrounded it, built a huge siege works against it. Now there lived in that city a man poor but wise, and he saved the city by his wisdom. But nobody remembered that poor man. So I said, wisdom is better than strength, but the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are no longer heeded. Here's this guy did this great thing. Everybody forgot about it. Solomon continues, verse 17. The quiet words of the wise are more to be heeded than the shouts of a ruler of fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. What's his point? His point is it's better to be wise than foolish. It's better to be righteous than wicked. But still, even if you have all of those things, that does not eliminate the uncertainties of your life. And so if I could summarize the point here, I would just say it like this. Wisdom provides an edge, but it does not provide immunity. Can we say that together? Wisdom provides an edge, but it does not provide immunity. You can put in your absolute best effort, but there's still some things that are totally outside of your control. Some of you are more aware of this than others. Some of you maybe who are self-employed or some of you who work on commission, you know that things can go to, from feast to famine in like a second. It can be wonderful, then it can be the pits, and uh, it can turn on a dime like that. And you know there's not a whole, a whole lot of assurance. Uh, and because of that, maybe you're more aware of this than uh, others of us who have the illusion of security in our jobs. But the truth is, whether you're on commission or not, no matter where you work, there's no guarantee of perpetual success for any of us. Life is unpredictable. There's too many uncertainties. It can feel like madness. This reminds me of a passage in the New Testament in James chapter 4. So much so that I kind of wonder if James was doing his morning devotionals in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 before he wrote this chapter in James chapter 4. So I just want to take a detour just for a couple moments to remind ourselves of what James said in the New Testament because it's very, very similar. James said this, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. So what's going on here in this text? There's a couple of guys, a couple of business people, and they're making some plans. A couple of entrepreneurs, a couple of go-getters. They're talking about getting their bases covered, and they've got this detailed business plan. We're going to go here, we're going to do this, all is well and good. And there's wisdom there, there's wisdom in planning. The Bible says if you don't plan, you're a fool in the book of Proverbs, so don't misunderstand. It's wise to plan. You should plan. What's wrong is when we plan without God. See, when we plan without God, there's a word for that. It's called presumption. 
presumption is forgetting that I don't know everything. It's forgetting that God might have a better plan than mine or a better idea than mine. And sometimes we forget God when we plan. Even Christians forget God when we plan. We worship God on Sunday, but then Monday through Friday, it's like we live practically as atheists. When it comes to planning, we have to include God, not think of God as an afterthought. That would be a huge mistake. Why? Because we just don't know. James continues in verse 14. He says this, what is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Your life is a mist. Like when you go outside in the winter and you're talking to someone and you can see your breath and then your breath just kind of floats away like a mist. It's here and it's gone. James says your life is just like that. It's here and then it's gone. Does this concept sound familiar? This is exactly what Solomon has been saying throughout the book of Ecclesiastes. Life is a mist. It's here, then it's gone. One of these days it's going to be gone. One of these days, I'm going to be six feet under the ground or in an urn somewhere or in a mausoleum somewhere, and so are you. I'm not trying to be morbid, but we don't have an unlimited amount of time in front of us. Our life is, relatively speaking, short. It is a mist. So what's the solution? James says this, verse 15. Instead, when you're making your plans, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Now, notice something here. James says that when I make plans without God, when I presume, it's not just that I'm being forgetful. James says, Dave, it's way deeper than that. You're being prideful. You remember the Titanic? You remember they built this ship and they boasted about this ship, the ship of dreams? Remember they said God himself cannot sink this ship? They were so confident that they didn't pack enough lifeboats on the deck. And what happened? They forgot to factor in the icebergs. And the results were catastrophic. James says, when you make your plans like that and you boast like that, that's not pleasing to God. Instead, he says, say it like this, if the Lord wills, we will do this or that. And when you pray like that and think like that and plan like that, it doesn't display a lack of faith just to simply acknowledge that. I would argue it actually displays great faith and trust in God's sovereignty. This is something that Christians have done for centuries. They make their plans, and then they submit their plans to our sovereign, all-powerful, good, and gracious God. Evangelist D.L. Moody used to always sign his letters with these two letters at the very end, DV, which was Latin for Deo Valente, meaning God willing. That's wisdom. Brothers and sisters, can I ask you, what are you planning right now? I would implore you, based on Scripture, to hold your plans in this way. Recognize that we are limited in our knowledge. And as Christians, we must make our plans, but we always do so in pencil, not pen, recognizing that God is the true author of the story of our lives. This is what Solomon is saying. This is why you need God to find meaning in this madness. There are many, 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 many uncertainties, things you don't know. There's things that you don't even know that you don't know. This is why being a friend of God is such incredibly good news, because God knows everything. The scripture teaches that he's omniscient. In Job 37, he's called perfect in knowledge, meaning God knows everything about you, everything about your life, everything about your plans, everything about your family, everything about the world, everything about the future, everything about what would happen. He even knows what would have happened but doesn't happen if he had allowed that to happen. He knows everything. He he knows everything. The end from the beginning, Isaiah 46. That means he knows who's going to be our next president. That means he knows um, what you're doing tomorrow. He knew you were coming to church today. He knew you were going to sit in that particular seat when you came to church today. He knows what you're going to have for breakfast tomorrow. I'm not having breakfast tomorrow. He knows that too. (laughs) You should have breakfast. He knows everything. This is why we come to church and stand in awe and worship our sovereign, all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing God. This is why we sang today, oh, lift your eyes to heaven, see the Holy One eternal, behold the Lord of majesty exalted in his temple. This is why we say, as symphonies of angels praise, now strain to sound his glory, come worship, fall before his grace, the King in all his beauty. How worthy, how worthy, how worthy. In the midst of uncertainty, we cling in faith to our sovereign and omniscient and holy God. Now, in light of who he is, do you see how foolish it is to live your life without him? 
Do you see how foolish it is to look to astrology and crystals, the things that this sovereign God made to predict the future and and eliminate uncertainty in your life rather than looking to the creator of all things? This is wisdom. Okay, I understand that, Pastor Dave. There's many uncertainties. But what do I do personally when those uncertainties come my way? What do I do when they hit me, the uncertainties of life? What do you do when things don't work out the way that they should work out, when the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer? Do we punt our faith? Do we say, forget about it, this stuff doesn't work? Do we say, let's chunk it, I'm going to turn over to the stars? No, no, no. Let me remind you of what Solomon said in chapter 9, verse 1. He has taught us already that it is all in God's hands. I did a funeral recently for a man who always used to say that. It's in God's hands. And this is what his wife shared with me and his three boys shared with me. And this phrase that dad used to always say, it's in God's hands, brought them great comfort after he had passed away. It's in God's hands. And the person who really believes that and who fears God can have a characteristic in their life that is absolutely magnificent, even in the face of uncertainty. And it is the character trait called poise, moral and spiritual poise. Do you know what the word poise means? It comes from the word pose, meaning to freeze without moving. A posit is a truth that you believe and that you hold on to. You hold your position. You have poise. You don't shift around due to outside circumstances. That's poise. In athletics, it means in basketball, when you're on the free throw line, at the end of the game, in the one and one, and the score is tied, and the lights are popping, And the crowd is going crazy so much so that you can't even hear yourself think. It means you walk up to that foul line and you put your toe right in the middle of that foul line where you've always put your toe. And you bounce that ball three times just like you've always bounced the ball three times. And then you follow through on your shot just like you've always followed through on your shot. And you shoot that ball just like you shot it in your driveway in third grade. That's poise. Friends, just like that, Solomon says, when the uncertainties of life come, when evil men prosper, when bad things happen to good people, when all of these mad things happen in your life, hold your ground, hold your position, and believe even this is in God's hands. This is a choice. This is a faith-based decision. When bad things happen, here's what I do. I dry my tears. I take a breath. I bow my head and say, Lord, even though I don't understand it, I will trust you. That's poise. There will come a time in your life, if it hasn't come already, where this will be tested for you. When you are hit with uncertainty, when terrible suffering comes your way, when your mate does not treat you the way that you should be treated, when someone crosses over the double yellow line and does tremendous damage, in that moment, what you do is you bring your Bible to church, you sing the old, old hymns, and you go with the faith of your fathers, and you worship the God of heaven and earth. That's poise. Proverbs 17, 27, he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. And you follow the example of your Lord Jesus Christ, who set his face like flint toward Jerusalem and went to the cross, maintaining his poise all the way to Calvary. Trusting his father. How do you deal with uncertainty and evil in an evil day? You trust God and you do the right thing and you maintain your moral and spiritual poise. I love the way Rudyard Kipling writes about this in his famous poem written from the perspective of a father to his son. The poem is called If. Maybe you're familiar with it. I'll just share a couple lines. He says this, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And which is more, you'll be a man, my son. This is poise. 
in the face of the many uncertainties of life, Solomon says you need to trust that it's in God's hands and maintain your poise. Movement three. We talked about the one thing that's certain. We talked about the many things that are uncertain. And now we're going to talk about all the things in life that don't require certainty for you to enjoy them. So back up with me to the middle, the burger in between the sandwich, the beef patty here, uh, the, the center of the passage. Verse 7. Solomon says, Go and eat your food with gladness and drink your wine with a joyful heart. For God has already proved of what you do. Always be clothed in white and always anoint your head with oil. Pause there for a second. This is the sixth of seven different, what they call the enjoyment exhortation sections in the book of Ecclesiastes. Sometimes people call them the carpe diem sections, meaning seize the day sections. But this is the only time in any of those sections that Solomon actually phrases it in the form of a command. The word go is in the imperative mood. He is commanding you to go. This is a wake-up call, like an alarm clock. Go, 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 go. Stop bemoaning death's certainty. Stop lamenting and stressing all of life's, over all of life's uncertainties and go. Enjoy, get over that. Enjoy what you have today. You're missing out on life today. In other words, Solomon is saying, don't let the joy of today be darkened by the fact that you don't know everything about tomorrow. Go. Enjoy the day today. Enjoy your life while you still have it. You see, many Christians believe that they, they shouldn't be enjoying life. God created this whole world for you to enjoy it. The word Eden means delight. God intends for you to have this life and, and, and rejoice in all that he's given to you as, as a gift. One of my profs, Howard Hendricks, used to say, Man, most Christians' faces look like they make good cover art for the book of Lamentations. <laughs> That's true. That's not good. God intends for you to experience real joy. Verse 8, he says, go to a party. Those are words that would describe you going to a party, wearing white clothes and anointing your head with oil. That means you need to go, you need to get cleaned up, you need to get gussied up, you need to go put on your good clothes, and you need to get out of the house, and you need to go out to dinner, and not McDonald's. You should go out somewhere nice, and you should eat, you should chew your food when you're there. You should enjoy that. Have I recommended to you Reese's peanut butter cup ice cream? <laughs> I should get a commission. I'm sorry. That'll be the last time. I promise. That's probably last time. But it is the kind of ice cream the disciples ate. I know that for sure. <laughs> that great theologian Ferris Bueller said it this way, life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop to look around once in a while, you just might miss it. I'm not talking about fleshly hedonism, neither is Solomon. Solomon is saying there's a moral urgency to you pursuing enjoyment today. C.S. Lewis used to say, joy is the serious business of heaven. Seize the day. If I could put it this way, the point in movement three is this, seize the day before the day seizes you. Can we say that together? Seize the day before the day seizes you, meaning before you pass on. Isn't that good advice in the midst of all the uncertainties? that life can throw at you, be fully present in your life today. This is what Solomon is teaching. Two more verses in this section. 9 and 10. Solomon goes on. Enjoy life with your wife whom you love all the days of this meaningless life. Meaningless meaning hevel, short, futile, short-lived that God has given you under the sun all of your meaningless days. For this is your lot in life and in your toilsome labor under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For in the realm of the dead where you're going, there is neither working nor planning nor knowledge nor wisdom. In the midst of all of these uncertainties, husbands, love your wife. Husbands, enjoy life with your wife today because tomorrow she might be gone or you might be gone. I have done a lot of, I'll just speak to the men here for a second. I have done a lot of funerals for husbands because their wives have passed away. And I can tell you every single time as an absolute fact that when a husband has to stand up here in front of his wife's casket and say goodbye to his wife and to bury his wife, in that moment, I'm not exaggerating when I say that man would literally trade every single thing he has for one more moment to just tell that woman one more time how much he loves her and how much he appreciates her and how grateful he is for her in his life. He would trade everything for one more moment with her. 
So Solomon says, in light of that, why don't you do that now? Why don't you do that while she's still living? Why don't you tell her you love her now? Why don't you appreciate her now? Why don't you buy flowers today? Wives, same thing. Do it now. Enjoy your husbands now. Enjoy this fleeting life. Enjoy your family. Enjoy your kids. Enjoy your job. Enjoy your hobbies. Seize the day before the day seizes you. And so if I could summarize Ecclesiastes chapter 9 with one sentence, here's what Solomon has been teaching us in chapter 9. Here's what this means. Solomon is teaching us, the scripture is teaching us this, life is a gift to be enjoyed, not a game to be mastered. Life is a gift from God to be enjoyed, not a game to be mastered. So how do you deal with uncertainty? Well, When it comes to the one thing in your life that's certain, Solomon says, live your life backwards. And when it comes to the many things in your life that are uncertain, Solomon says, maintain your spiritual poise. And then third, seize the day before the day seizes you. Why? Because life is a gift to be enjoyed, not a game to be mastered. The secret to dealing with uncertainty in life is trusting that your life is in God's hands. Would you pray with me? As the worship team comes to lead us in one song and prepares our hearts for communion, let's bow our heads and close our eyes together. God, we thank you for the gift of our lives. Forgive us for the times that we allow all of the uncertainties to steal away the joy and the experience of having holy pleasure in the sacred moments that you give us today. So help us to live our life in faith and trust in in you, the one who loves us and who, who died for us and who's always good and whose goodness is chasing us. Lord, if we believe that you're in charge, if we believe that all of this is in your hands and we're not in control, so what? We trust the one who is. If we know and trust the one who is in control, we believe that our life is in your hands. And we can have peace, even in the midst of uncertainty. Thank you, Lord, for this beautiful truth. We rest in you today in Jesus' name. Amen.